Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the uh, following three speakers uh, from the sports cardiologists from the uh, Liverpool John Morris uh, University. And the first one uh, is Professor Chief George. Professor Chief George is a professor in exercise and cardiovascular physiology, associate dean for research and the head of research institute for sports and exercise science at Liverpool John Morris University. After a Commonwealth scholarship at Queen's University, Canada, he completed his uh, PhD thesis on cardiac adaptation to exercise training in 1998. His primary research focus has been on the impact of acute or chronic exercise on the heart and the circulation system, especially related to the utilization of novel imaging technologies. He has published over 200 original peer-reviewed journal articles publications. He is currently an editor of three international journals and re reviews grants and original research papers for a range of high-impact journals and prestigious grant funding bodies around the group. Uh, without further ado, so welcome Professor George. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very much to uh, the Hong Kong organizers for uh, inviting uh, myself and uh, colleagues from the university. It's a great pleasure to, to be here. Um, I hope this one uh, will be interesting at two levels. This is a bit of a personal journey through uh, my experience with uh, sports cardiology. Um, some of the dates on some of the papers will be a bit of a giveaway for that, but it's also a good scientific exercise in terms of don't believe everything you read or at least keep asking questions uh, about what um, is reality in some of these particular topics. So some of you may or may not have heard of the Morgan Roth hypothesis, but this is a, this is a, a talk about how big um, the heart can get and how big it develops with, with physical training. Um, so I'm going to start off very briefly and just talk uh, for a few seconds about why the upper limits of cardiac adaptation uh, matter in this particular uh, format. I'm going to define for you the Morgan Roth hypothesis, which is a study um, written in the early 1970s. And then I'm going to <coughs> really look critically at the evidence base over the last 40 years as to whether the Morgan Roth hypothesis is, is something that really, truly exist before making a few uh, summary comments. So, some of the people in this room will have seen this slide on many occasions. Um, the key issue facing uh, cardiologists, scientists, clinicians when looking at this particular problem of pre-participation screening is clearly trying to differentiate what is the athlete's heart from, from the pathological heart. And whether you're using measurements of heart size uh, in terms of walls or measurements of uh, ventricular dimensions or here and here looking at uh, the ECG, the phenotypical presentation of the athletic heart is not entirely distinct from that of pathology. There is a crossover and many people refer to this as the, the gray zone. And this is where differential diagnosis is quite difficult. Now, I'm going to talk now predominantly about physiology. I'll let other people talk about pathology in the, uh, in the following presentations. But I'm interested to know where this edge of the phenotype is. How big <coughs> does the left ventricular wall get? How big does the left ventricular chamber get? What, what, in terms of the process, if we know what the upper limits are, then the differential diagnostic process is going to be uh, somewhat easier for us. So that's really why uh, this topic is of interest. Now, let's go back 40 years. Uh, beyond 40 years ago, we, we were interested in the heart of athletes, but we didn't know much beyond what happened with the ECG and blood pressure. There were a few x-ray studies um, of cardiac silhouettes and, and enhanced size from, a, from, a, from an x-ray study. But this paper <coughs> was a groundbreaker because it was the first time that ultrasound echocardiography had been applied 
in the setting of sports participants. Uh, it was presented in 1975. Um, actually, it was first presented at a marathon conference in New York, and it got a lot of scientific and lay press um, interest in it because there were a couple of key messages. The first one was that in terms of the overall left ventricular mass, most athletes have some degree of hypertrophy. And what uh, Morgan Roth and his colleagues did was they, they took a whole bunch of college and national level athletes uh, and assessed them against uh, some sedentary controls who are normal uh, college uh, uh, students. What interestingly though he did was he split them into groups of swimmers, runners and wrestlers. Uh, and in, in this first analysis that didn't really seem to matter irrespective of their sporting background or training background, they presented with big hearts. What came next was fundamentally the most important uh, element of this data set. And that was, he wanted to define how the hypertrophy was occurring. Was the heart mass itself increasing, or was the size of the chamber increasing so that the mass surrounding the heart is increasing in that particular proportion. So what they did was they then looked at wall thickness. Here's the left ventricular free wall. Here's the left ventricular septal wall. And uh, a pattern emerged. So here's our runners and swimmers, the aerobic type athletes. Here's our normal healthy controls. And there is really no difference here in wall thickness between those groups. But if you go to the wrestlers, the anaerobic, the strength athletes, you've got wall thicknesses uh, over 13 millimeters here, 13 millimeters. So there's a difference in the actual thickness of the, of the left ventricular wall in that particular group. Conversely, if you looked at the left ventricular internal dimension and end diastole, here, the wrestlers and the normal sedentary individuals are very similar, around about 46, 47 millimeters. But both of the endurance groups, the swimmers and the runners, have an elevated uh, LV cavity at around about 54 to 57 millimeters. So this data here, left ventricular mass is being generated by different morphology. Here, it's wall thickness. Here, it's increased chamber dimension. So this dichotomy, this difference in training exposure, was entirely unique in the first echocardiographic study uh, of elite athletes. Automatically, this gained significant attention in the clinical and scientific world. And um, this is me, 25 years ago, so that tells you how old I am, and also it tells you probably eventually how stupid I am. But this was really quite an important philosophical argument about how the heart responded to training. Uh, and we put this uh, slide together in a, in a review paper. Here's the sedentary individual. Uh, this is the uh, LV cavity of around about 45, 47 millimeters and a wall thickness probably around about uh, 8 to 10 millimeters. And effectively what we have is two different types of uh, athletic adaptation. Firstly, we have the insurance trained athlete. And <clears throat> what we did was we tried to think of the hemodynamic mechanisms behind the phenotypical presentation. And we also got some data um, from pathological conditions that, that uh, helped this hemodynamic theory out quite substantially. One of the things with, we know with uh, endurance training is you get a chronic beat to beat to beat increase in preload. You're getting a, a chronic stretch as the people are exercising because of the increased preload. That acts as a mechanical, hemodynamic mechanical stimulus for an increase in left ventricular dimension. 
you're getting a serial replication, replication of sarcomeres so that the chamber size increases. Uh, interestingly, if you get uh, pathological disease states like aortic or mitral regurgitation where you get continuous left ventricular uh, stretch, the same thing happens. So this is a volume overload presentation and is often referred to as eccentric hypertrophy. The other side of the equation, though, is substantially different. When we perform isometric power resistance training, one of the common hemodynamic features is that we get a significant increase in aortic pressure. That increases cardiac afterload. That provides a pressure hemodynamic stimulus uh, and results in the parallel replication of sarcomeres, thus left ventricular wall thickness goes up. And if you move from the intermittent training to the, uh, the continuous um, pathology where you get similar changes in aortic pressure, lo and behold, these people have thick left ventricular walls. This is a hemodynamic pressure overload mechanism resulting in a concentric hypertrophy where the thickening of the wall uh, is out of step with the, the chamber changes. Two different patterns. That now is probably produced in certainly most of the sports cardiology textbooks that I've ever read in the intervening 30 years. If you train differently, you get different forms of the athletic heart. However, that was one study. And if there's anybody in this room who, who's um, uh, used echocardiography a lot, they will understand the massive differences in imaging technologies between 2016 and 1975. 1975 uh, was ice pick M mode echocardiography alone, and that's it. Um, so in the intervening 40 years, We've had substantial changes in measurement tools. Uh, echocardiography has come on substantially. We've now got MRI as well. But of course, in terms of the initial study, this was a cross-sectional athlete control comparison. We're also interested in what might happen with intervention studies. And there's also other issues related to uh, the technique of data interpretation that are worthwhile looking at. So I want to present now 40-year retrospective view of the data. And I'll split it into the two forms of exercise training. We'll start off with endurance exercise, people like this uh, fella here. And endurance exercise is exercise of a prolonged nature that involves a, uh, an elevation of cardiac output and stroke volume for periods of time normally greater than 30 minutes per session. Now. Let me say that if you type in the words endurance exercise, athletic heart, echocardiography into PubMed in 2016, you'll come up with two, 3,000 references. It's been a very, very popular area of research in the last 40 years, and there have been a substantial number of, of meta-analyses uh, produced. Now, the first data that I'm just going to show you here um, is purely related to left ventricular mass. Here's the untrained data, here's the endurance, and irrespective of whether you use MRI or a whole host of different echocardiographic equations, you'll see from a comparative perspective, the numbers in the endurance trained athletes are always significantly bigger than they are in the uh, untrained individuals. So these people here, the endurance trained athletes, consistently demonstrate a left ventricular hypertrophy. And it's of, of the range of around about 20 to 40% increase in left ventricular mass. And it's remarkably consistent, not just in individual studies, but also in the meta-analyses. Now clearly what we want to know is whether that is as a consequence of an increased end diastolic volume for the uh, eccentric model. And this is just some of the MRI data. From a structural perspective, MRI is now our gold standard. Uh, 
Uh, and in all of these studies comparing endurance athletes and controls, you see LV mass is greater, LV mass is greater, LV mass is greater. And when you go across to the end diastolic volume, you've got a concomitant increase here and here, here and here, here and here. So the LV mass change is largely as a consequence of an increased ventricular volume. Okay, that's the cross-sectional uh, data. It's important to look at training studies. There are really two types of training studies out there. There are ones uh, that look at seasonal variation uh, in elite athletes, and I've picked out five studies here. In all five studies, the period of the greatest training volume, either sequentially or accumulated over years, results in a greater cavity dimension. This is again really quite powerful evidence because of the uh, repetitive perspective nature uh, that endurance training results in remodeling of the chamber volume. If you look at other training studies that obviously take the other end of the uh, continuum in terms of physical activity, these people who were previously sedentary the picture gets a little bit patchier, but what you've got to be aware of is that there's very significant differences in the exposure, both from a time course and also from an exercise volume. But three out of these studies are seeing an increase in chamber volume, even within relatively untrained people over relatively short periods of time. Now, I'll just take one a specific group of people and one specific issue very quickly and that's ultra endurance athletes and I, I touch on this in this talk very very briefly um, because these represent the people with the greatest training exposure and again if you're a physiologist one of the things that you would expect more exposure more adaptation um, and that was, has been sort of backed up a little bit in a couple of studies uh, in the scientific literature. Uh, one from Spain uh, and, and one from uh, Japan up here. So what I've got over here is a representation of most of the reviews and meta-analyses in endurance athletes that would suggest average sort of septal thickness about 10 millimeters, LV dimension of about 54 millimeters. The problem is, is if you go uh, and look at these two particular studies, this is uh, Tour de France cyclists, uh, and this is 100 mile runners. The data that they present is substantially different. These are ultra endurance athletes, and they are seeing septal wall thicknesses up to 19 millimeters, and they are seeing cavity dimensions up to 75 millimeters. Now that might fit with the concept of more stimulus, more response, but of course conceptually that's problematic. Certainly problematic from a pre-participation screening because you go from a, a gray zone that looks like that to a gray zone that looks like that. You're pushing the upper limit of the athletic phenotype all the way out here. Um, and I'll just show you one set of data that we managed to collect at the Western States 100-mile uh, uh, trial race uh, a couple of years ago with, with, uh, with John and Dave and colleagues um, in, as, a consequence, as a consequential response to some of those studies. We actually managed to recruit a fairly sizable cohort of 165 of these people who, who run 100-mile trail races for fun. And, uh, the, the key really is not necessarily the, the, the average data, but the average data is remarkably similar to our general endurance trained athletes. But the upper limits here of 62 millimeters and 14 millimeters for wall thickness are nowhere near the data produced by the Japanese and the Spanish uh, authors. So. Uh, less of a concern, I think, to be perfectly honest, and we can talk about the Tour de France paper later on. Effectively, if we draw a conclusion in relation to endurance trained athletes, we've got 40 years of data that suggests that they have higher left ventricular mass. This is a consequence of a 
higher left ventricular end diastolic volume, a balanced hypertrophy, an eccentric hypertrophy of the left ventricle. I haven't shown you this data, but you get similar responses in the RV and the atria. We don't think there's excessive hypertrophy in the ultra-endurance athlete. Some evidence of improved function. So the Morgan-Roth hypothesis in this case seems to be well substantiated. If you do this type of activity, um, then you are going to see that form of adaptation. The other side of the equation are these fellas. Now the first thing to say is if you type in resistance exercise, echocardiography, athletic heart into PubMed, you will see substantially less research activity. And to be perfectly honest, the other issue is that when you look at that data, resistance trained athletes come in many forms, not just your weightlifter, but also your track and field athlete, your sprinter, uh, and other types of athletes where the training stimulus is probably way more complex than it is in an endurance trained athlete. So what do we have in terms of data? Well, I think the first thing that you recognize almost instantaneously is that if you go into the literature, you can find some data, some studies supporting the evidence uh, existence of concentric hypertrophy. But for every study that says yes, you can also find a study that says no. We didn't see elevated wall thicknesses uh, in these type of athletes. Uh, and two studies really made me start to reconsider that map and model that I drew in 1991. The first one of these was a study by the Italians in the early 90s. I'm not going to show you the data, you only need to see the title, and that is absence of left ventricular wall thickening in athletes engaged in intense power training. The reason that paper was quite powerful is because of the numbers of athletes that were studied. These were all um, Olympic level athletes and because of the uh, screening program that the Italians uh, undertake, there were over 100 athletes in this, not 10, not 15, a substantial number. The next paper that got me interested was this one. Um, and it's not something that we think about in terms of an athletic heart population. Sumo wrestlers, for most of us, are just big people. Actually, for most of us, fat big people. And they literally move about three or four yards and run into somebody else who's big and fat. And they bounce around and somebody falls out and somebody wins. But Physiologically, these, these people are actually quite interesting. The first reason they're interesting is the fact that they are enormous. Okay, this is the average weight. We've got people up to 182 kilograms. Very, very big people. In terms of the lean mass, which we think is the primary uh, driver uh, for heart size, we've got people who've got 126 kilograms of lean tissue. I don't think there's anybody in this room who weighs 126 kilograms. Never mind has 126 kilograms of effectively muscle mass. So these are big people. Um, and from a, a, an exercise perspective, these are probably about as pure power strength athletes as you can get. They do no aerobic physical training. If you, if you look at their, their training diaries and their training programs, the only endurance activity they do is eating. Okay? They do short bursts of power training, uh, technical training, uh, but their physical training is all high intensity, very short duration activity. So the, the data hit from this, these guys is always going to be interesting. And here's their echo data. Mean wall thickness, 10 millimeters, 10 millimeters. This is exactly the same average wall thickness of an endurance trained athlete. Okay. Their internal dimension, 
58 millimetres average is actually slightly bigger than an endurance trained athlete. But that's probably because these guys eat endurance trained athletes for breakfast. You know, if you weigh 180 kilograms, you are over three times the size of the average marathon runner. So it wouldn't be surprising that you've got this sort of cavity size. Uh, and the number of people out of this group with LV wall thickness greater than 30 millimeters was down below 2%. So really no pattern of concentric hypertrophy. You go to the MRI data, look at LV mass, very little difference, very little difference, very little difference. End diastolic volume, very little difference, very little difference, very little difference. If LV mass and end diastolic volume are not different, LV wall thickness is not different. No concentric hypertrophy. If you look at the training studies, there are very few training studies in these particular types of athletes. We were fortunate enough to do an MRI study uh, a couple of years ago. We had six months of Olympic weight training in previously sedentary individuals. No change, no change at all in any of the cardiac dimensions assessed uh, via MRI. Uh, and this is uh, one of our PhD students who did a, a, a meta-analysis recently. If, again, if you look at the wall thickness data for the endurance trained athletes and the resistance trained athletes, no difference. No concentric remodeling or concentric hypertrophy in, in these particular groups. So quickly ask two questions. Why isn't there um, concentric hypertrophy in resistance trained athletes? Well, the first thing you might ask yourself is what's the exposure to the stimulus? So we know that the stimulus during heavy resistance exercise is that you can get blood pressures peaking at this particular level. This is average data. This is case study data in people doing double leg press. This is, a, this is an invasive uh, pressure catheter study classic study from the Canadians. But the problem is, if you go and look at that data, of course the blood pressure does peak during the hold phase of a double leg press. But if you look at the lift and the release phase and the period in between uh, repetitions, blood pressure rapidly normalizes. Okay. If you then actually integrate that into what the training exposure is and you look at the time period where blood pressure is increased, it equates to about seven minutes per training session, which equates to about one hour per week. That's the physiological stimulus training, not the total training time. But that's not a lot of exposure. That would be a control sedentary person if you just took exercise exposure. The other thing is, if you, if you valsalva dur during these type of activities, because you get a massive increase in intrathoracic pressure, the transmural pressure stays constant. So even at peak uh, double leg press, fractional area change in these athletes is maintained. Function is maintained. So maybe there is no real afterload stimulus during these type of activities. A couple of questions. Why is there some evidence of concentric hypertrophy? And I'll just touch on these very briefly. The first one's quite interesting, and I've presented it here uh, in terms of left ventricular mass, but you can do the same thing with left ventricular wall thickness. And that is, if you compare weightlifters with controls, you get this sort of data. And the group is often skewed because of these people here. These guys have got the biggest LV masses. But if you plot LV mass against fat-free mass, the reality is, in all groups, you've got a linear relationship. These guys have got big hearts because they are big people. If you take two people with the same fat-free mass, surprise, surprise, they have the same left ventricular mass. That's not true hypertrophy. And the final one with a lot of these studies, especially in the 1970s, especially 
uh, with things like the, the Tour de France is you have to be very careful about performance enhancing drugs. This is some data from some colleagues in Germany with the biggest concentric uh, ratio coming in bodybuilders who are abusing androgenic anabolic steroids. So the summary is resistance trained athletes, very sporadic evidence of wall thicknesses and concentric hypertrophy. And we do need to be very careful about specific technical considerations of drugs and, and normalization of data. And I think to be perfectly honest, when you look at the Morgan Roth hypothesis for these type of athletes, the answer is no. It really doesn't seem to happen. So in summary, and this is really quite a key point for the pre-participation screening process, is that when you're looking for these types of data here and here, and also the uh, ECG activity, the gray zone, the people who are going to be living in this area here are going to be either your endurance trained athletes or your big athletes. And concentric hypertrophy is exceptionally uncommon in any athlete presenting in a pre-participation screening program, and that's a huge red flag for follow-up. Looking forward, I've talked to you really purely about the right ventricle, uh, the left ventricle. We've got to look at the, uh, the right ventricle and the atria. There are a whole host of new imaging technologies, and clearly there are different populations, uh, including some of our, our Hong Kong athletes, who we need to look at and look at some of these relationships. But understanding the physiology of the athlete is the first step to being clear about what is pathology and what is a problem for those few athletes who may be at risk of sudden cardiac death. Thank you for your time and for listening.